welcome to the NIVIS World Architecture Day interview series. I'm Paul Thornwell, NIVIS General Manager of Product Sales and Marketing. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our host, Linda Cheng, Editor of Architecture AG. And I can't wait to hear from our first interview subject, none other than Koichi Takata. Over to you, Linda. Hello, and welcome to the NIVIS World Architecture Day interview series. In this series, we'll be talking to four architects about why architecture matters and what lasting effects this challenging time will have on the future of architecture. Today, we'll be joined by Koichi Takada from Koichi Takada Architecture. Originally from Japan, Koichi established a practice in Sydney in 2008, which is now world renowned and has projects on multiple continents. The practice has won a swag of awards and has collaborated with the likes of Jean Nouvelle and Kengo Kuma. Koichi, welcome to the series. Thank you. Um, you grew up in Japan and has studied, you studied in London and New York. What, um, how has these uh, large uh, cities shaped your understanding of architecture? Yeah, I think um, learning from the past, and um, experiencing uh, is really very much important part of learning process, uh, becoming in an architect. So for me, uh, you know, fortunate enough to uh, be exposed to all these different cities, um, uh, you know, become a very much important part of um, you know, the ingredients that that make myself wanting to be an architect. And uh, the learning from the past does shape, uh, you know, the future in many ways. Uh, and uh, so, you know, this was very much an important process for me. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, how does that shape uh, understanding of becoming an architect and what, we, what I do today? When you look at uh, the context of, uh, let's say, the Australian cities, um, Sydney, Melbourne, uh, you know, five million population, sort of even number, mm -hmm. and Brisbane is 2.5, catching up to Melbourne and Brisbane, if you like. But when you look at, you know, London uh, is then the double that, nine million. And, and then the New York is then called it double the London, so uh, 18 million. Then the Tokyo is then double New York, so 37 million. So it's mm. kind of interesting that uh, for me, uh, you know, I grew up in Tokyo. I went to New York, then to London. <laughs> it's sort of scaling down in terms of population. And then now Sydney is the half of the scale. The question, the really, really important question while I'm practicing in Sydney today uh, is also, do we want to become like London? Do we want to become like New York? Do we want to ultimately become like Tokyo? And this is the question of urban densities and how architecture will contribute or perhaps play uh, something that to mitigate uh, the process of an urbanization and, and learning from the past. Is it the right way to do? And then for me, experiencing Tokyo, New York, let's say London, all double the size of any of the Australian cities. There's something that I question. I form a lot of question living in this, you know, very dense, high dense, uh, you know, urban living, city living. And what I do today is perhaps answering to this question. Well, wow. when when you talk about it like that, the doubling and doubling again, I've I've never thought about it like that. What prompted you to establish a practice in Sydney? Um, so I came the first time uh, in 1998. Uh, so before Sydney Olympic, um, I, I just fell in love with Australia and. One of the main reasons, I suppose, again, going back to the questioning of living in, in, in the 
you know, a city like Tokyo uh, or New York. And I felt that it's a bit too much uh, and everything is too close to you or you live in between this concrete jungle. Sydney, on contrary, you know, I, I found that sort of this beautiful uh, sense of balance between city and nature, if, if I may say so. Uh, and, uh, or at least, you know, we had that balance at the time, uh, almost 20 odd years ago. And, uh, and then I'm setting up a practice, you know, wanting to be close to nature and, and we have beautiful nature uh, in Australia and Sydney sort of had a lot of inspiration for me. Um, but again, the ambition is to really sustain that balance between city and nature, you know, that was pretty much my first impression. And then the ba that balancing act is something that we need to question today uh, in the urban condition, even to Australian cities, uh, less than half or half, half the size of all the other cities that I lived. And um, moving forward, how we wanna find this balance uh, between city and nature and this, is pretty much the key for me setting up a practice here. But the practice thing from Sydney, then now we have an international project to really launch this um, idea of, you know, how we can live or work or, you know, entertain ourselves within this, you know, very much urban context, but still very much close to nature. And how do we maintain that balance? How, how do we sustain this you know, uh, beautiful balance. Uh, and, and this is my motivation to be in Sydney and, and practice in Sydney. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's it's really interesting that um, if you see uh, photos of city cities around the world during lockdown, nature is coming back because the people aren't, aren't there anymore. And I was wondering in this pandemic times, how has that affected your practice? Well, uh, pandemic crisis, uh, I suppose uh, for us, uh, many of us first time experiencing this and very much affected uh, my practice. Um, very challenging time. And, uh, and then again, it's not so long ago, we all experienced this. Um, but uh, what I thought, I don't know, we uh, would like to see something that I suppose maybe uh, it seems a negative circumstances, but trying to see positive in neg negative. So turn the negative, see negative negative aspect as a you know a opportunity. Uh, so we saw it as an opportunity to really pause. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say my practice stopped, but almost felt like we had to pause ourselves, and if not complete stop, let's call it very much slow down. And this helped us, I don't know, we, we make ourselves available to talk about a lot of other things, perhaps other than architecture. And there was a great opportunity to really rethink about uh, a lot of things. You know, obviously we spent a lot of time talking about management side of trying to you know survive through the pandemic crisis but also we question you know is this what we really want to keep doing and how can we really contribute to you know societies and and uh, you know even if you if, if i may say more the, the, you know the global the planet you know side of much much bigger uh you know the crisis that we, we experienced, not just pandemic, you know, not so long ago, we had bushfire crisis in Australia. And, uh, you know, th these crises that we experienced in front of us, you know, very much uh, made us aware of things that, why are you busy doing practicing architecture, designing, uh, you know, you'd of course hope to make the best in intention available to everything you do. But is that really the best intention? 
what, what are we really doing as an architect in a much wider context? And the pandemic was really about, I think we learned, it, it, it was about the sharing and the caring for the vulnerable and of course the elderly. And it's not just looking at the certain niche, but we really needed to open our eyes. So, you know, the pandemic affected us in terms of perhaps business uh, numbers point of view, economic sense um, and cash flow and all this business sense. But on the other hand, I don't, I don't know, when you look at the well-being of my practice, if we feel like we are coming out much healthier in terms of attitudes and giving gave us a lot of breathing space to think about a lot of other things that we feel like we found that you know the strength coming out of this the pandemic that we're all experiencing um, has really put a spotlight on what is essential so in your opinion what is essential in architecture a very good question. I think, you know, what's essential in architecture, uh, there, there's so many essentials and, and I cannot personally narrow down to certain elements, but certainly, you know, we are respons responsible for life. We're not doing architecture for architecture, if you know what I mean. I mean, we, we're doing this for us. And while as we were doing this for us, the people, for the humankind, we've forgotten the other things that we need to look after the environment. And pandemic uh, crisis or the, you know, the global warming, uh, the climate change issue, uh, we, we feel that something that much bigger than what we were focusing, you know, pre, uh, you know, COVID-19 and uh, we were gradually conscious of other factors that start to influence and becomes a very important force of what we do or how we draw inspiration and before very much perhaps when I was uh, being educated as an architect there was a lot of aesthetic sense of focus you know uh, and of course, these things are very important. Yes, architecture is very much still about the scale, the proportion, you know, uh, about the texture, the materiality, all these things, yes, very important part of architecture. However, I think our focus has shifted as the world has changed, uh, that perhaps the architecture is no longer just a local sense of being, but very much part of the big global sense in the, in the plant, you know, saving the our planet and, and uh, you know, let's say tackle against the climate change and there's so much we can do. So this is becoming an essential part of designing architecture and, 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 and pre-COVID or, you know, let's say 20 years ago when I came to Australia, uh, there was a lot about urbanization, trying to make this city attractive, so try to make, you know, the first impression of our city available to the world. So it, it was very much about focus on the built environment in an artificial sense. But the feel that that shift throughout the last 20 years from the artificial to more natural. And I think the shift from industrial to more natural, and then I think more emphasis on this natural uh, aspect is becoming more and more and more uh, to me and definitely to us essential part of architecture. The pandemic is causing a lot of changes very rapidly. What do you think are some of the changes that could be here to stay? Uh, I think, um, I mean, this challenged us and, you know, uh, in a lockdown situation, you know, we all went home and worked work from home and and home was never a workplace you know yes sometime but not full time sense and and we never wanted to blow boundary i mean work and life balance as we used to talk is very much important part of being healthy as a being and bringing you know work 
into your home and completely blurring or you know erasing that living part of it by creating that work on top of it, it was quite disturbing. Uh, but however, I think that you know uh, this so-called new new normal, um, you know, probably here to stay. It, it gave us that we can be flexible. We we don't have to you know, let's say travel so much to, you know, we have, for instance, international project and clients ask us to come every month. Uh, now, with this lockdown situation, we are not able to do so. So we force ourselves to use digital means to understand about the context, the culture. We, we uh, make available ourselves available to much more frequent, you know, uh, video conference conferencing and by way of doing this I think it, it you know you, you start to find a way to interact uh, in, 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 a, in a helpful uh, digital sense and, and I think there's a many what many things that probably would stay here and, and gave us the flexibility that is blurring boundary between the you know living and the working and perhaps in a, you know every other sense of what we used to call use and that was defined in each each niche and you know you try not to mediate in between but there was a way to you know filter through again perhaps more you know digital revolutions that imminent and um, you know this part of uh, you know uh, social scene would stay and whether that influenced the architecture and currently, we, we have, again, a lot of division in the world. And 20th century, as I call it, was creating a lot of divisions, you know, creating a lot of wall. But it feels like post-COVID, you know, this sense of walling needs to disappear and create more open space. And if it's not one big space, and then also talking about the breathing space, we need more breathing space. We need more balcony space. We need more space at home, you know, before was going smaller, now we need to reverse that cycle. So there's a lot of things that perhaps, you know, will stay, social distancing or, you know, the, the nice etiquette or wearing mask or, or all these things that then, you know, again, requires a more space. And, and, and this would probably have a, a good, uh, you know, outcome in, in, in perhaps the designing architecture uh, and would stay hopefully as a, you know, creation of more breathing space in architecture, more breathing space in the city. And I hope this would then become more breathing space in the whole world. And that, that's what we really need to focus. Yeah, wouldn't that be a lovely thing to have more breathing space in the city? Um, I've often read that you like to bend the rules. So what are these rules that you're talking about and how do you like to bend them? Well, we like we don't like straight <laughs> being straight <laughs> and linear. I think it, it, you know, look, it's very boring if it's everything is straight, and it it's very much an artificial means to create the rules and follow the rules. And you know, we all you know, I suppose, went to school and uh, learned how to conform and how to follow rules. You know, the bending part is uh, to me is um, very much part of the you know. Uh, creative process and I think without it perhaps there's no architecture and uh, and of course every site has a different conditions you know and I suppose as a human being everyone's different yourself myself you know mm -hmm. our friend or, or different people that's why it's very interesting so I question if you can design architecture as if one fits for all you know and um, and bending the rule then comes when you try to localize, you, you try to make it very site specific and uh, uh, architecture, you cannot just follow rules and create something that then, you know, let's call it the maximized opportunity uh, in, a, in a, you know, a good welfare, public welfare sense. But I think bending the rules is when you really start to challenge and negotiate in based on the very specific condition. 
and and then I think uh, negotiation is very much. Uh, I suppose, you know, uh, you know, maybe it's it's forgotten uh, act, but very much a human act. And I very very much enjoy, you know. And for instance, you know, you know, I went to site this morning wearing mask, and um, you know, trying to talk to builder with 1.5 meter social distancing, but talk about the details, and you know, we're really trying to work this out. And of course, we talk about the regulation, we talk about the safety, we talk about how the light comes and how the materialities changes and you know, in a rainy day, how do we drain water? All these things, you know, there's a one way to look at, you know, the following the rules, uh, but there's the other way that, you know, if you just follow the rules, you lose that sense of poetic and, uh, you know, very much a human, you know, the organic aspect of, um, you know, architecture, the more living part of architecture that you just can't describe when you're designing, you're just following the rules on the paper or the mm -hmm. computer screen. Then you go to site and realize, oh, you know, this is very different from what we were expecting. And, and then you adapt again, but then you need to again look against the rules and see whether we could negotiate so that we achieve, you know, what's best for the site. And uh, so this is very much important part of uh, creating uh, a good architecture. Yes, yes. Speaking of organic architecture, your um, National Museum of Qatar is one example of um, where you've done a very, very fluid design with lots of curved lines. And I was wondering, for this project, um, you take cues from Jean Nouvel's very expressive external architecture that is translated to the interior. How do you approach this kind of design integration? of creating a unified, cohesive expression of an idea across different design studios? Uh, there is no co cohesion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to be honest, you know, I can laugh and, and, and talk about it now. I mean, during when we were actually doing the work or well, this was initially a competition, well, in fact, John himself didn't know we were in the competition or he didn't even know this, there was a competition. Anyway, there was a lot of political, as opposed to political parts of tension uh, that we started this project. And, you know, first four to five years, well, we, we spent nine years doing this project, design, well, doing the competition we need a competition, working on a contract. Then we start design, develop, and travel back and forth, and you know, eventually got to start construction. Anyway, so nine to 10 years process. Half of which we were not conversing with, um, you, know, uh, you know, John and John's team, Nouvelle's team. And uh, we were quite disturbed by that because, you know, we wanted to sort of work together and respect the contest that given to us. And as you mentioned, this uh, very exp expressive architecture. And uh, we wanted to learn from uh, uh, you know, Jean Nouvel's team. And, and so f the first five years, we worked essentially blind, blindfold and, and no conversation, no cohesion. And it's, it's a very, very difficult way to work, but you know, ultimately, uh, I got to see uh, uh, Jean Nouvel himself and also the, the team. And uh, we start to sort of integrate uh, and converse, um, you know, the, the different, I suppose, the agreement and I suppose agree to disagree disagreement. But by then the design was done. So essentially, this was done in a, in a separate context. But one thing that I appreciated when I saw the museum, and, 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 and I don't know whether you've seen the architecture, uh, but it's the, inspired by Desert Rose, Desert mm -hmm. Roses. So in other words, interlocking uh, discs that's very complex shape and nothing is straight. Um, when we saw that, 
strangely, we found, if you find it very familiar to us, and, and where we found it is in nature, because nature, nothing is straight. It, it's very, very much organic context that given to us. And I don't know, we instantly loved it. And then we normally give them a box and then we could possibly do contrasting something that is more natural and, and organic geometry against the box. But we given this quite a complex topography, if you like, within the museum that then we created, um, you know, uh, interior architecture. And, and in many, many, many ways, we respected the idea of uh, crystallization that he drew inspiration from. Then we, we looked to the, for instance, the gift shop, the cave of light is the uh, same uh, process of crystallization of the sun in desert, but form something completely different. And this part of the cave draw uh, beautiful daylight into the, you know, very deep end of the cave and it was very dramatic and ins inspirational and and so we essentially learned the process of uh you know the john de bell designing architecture but we sort of took if you like the similar direction in taking that formation of the nature as an inspiration and then created this uh piece of interior architecture but in a completely different contrasting sense as a result. So the, the Nouvelle's uh, museum piece is very much a masculine, very strong, strong uh, materialities. Whereas, you know, my practice had this, you know, the solid timber and, you know, you have this sense of organic and soft enclosures and more, if you like, perhaps more feminine than people call it, but sense of smell of timber and, so it was in some way very much a contrast as a result. And it worked, I suppose, in the end, as we get uh, many feedbacks, good feedbacks and clients uh, uh, very, very happy. And uh, so it worked in the end, but it was very uh, difficult process uh, to, to get to the end. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can imagine. I mean, how do you infer a design intent without talking to them? Well, um, you know, thanks to computer technology, um, when we received the Katia drawings uh, from Nouvelle, well, we, we first couldn't open it because we didn't have Katia license, so we had to translate this model, Katia model to, um, uh, you know, the Rhino model. Uh, and then once we then realized in Rhino models, then we, we soon understood the complexity of the, 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 you know, the context that's given to us. And uh, it re really was about going through numbers of time and, you know, thankfully today with this uh, virtual technology, you could in somewhat experience more in the three-dimensional fashion. Again, this project, we could not have interpreted it 2D in any ways. So it had to be 3D, three-dimensionally designed. And, uh, but when I finally managed to visit the site, uh, luckily there was the steel structure was sort of going up halfway. In, in our space, uh, you know, most of our spaces, I saw the glimpse of sight line that I understood from my human scale you know, in a basic sense of human experience, despite the complexities of the geometry, understood where the light came, understood how you would walk along looking at the light or seeking the light, if you like, in the darkness. And, 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 and that gave us a great sense of orientation and from which we start to build, build our con concept or, you know, confirm that the design concept mm -hmm. that we perform during competition, uh, we verify it, if you like, uh, during the site visit. And this part of the experience uh, it was very, very important to, you know, gain some confidence. Uh, and then, but the rest was very much done, let's say, uh, you know, in a virtual, virtual space. Wow, it just shows the power of drawing and modeling, doesn't it? 
So for this uh, series, we're asking why architecture matters. And of course, for the profession, we know why architecture matters. But how do you communicate to the average person on the street why architecture should matter to them? Um, I think architecture uh, has been very much important part of um, our cities, you know, and define, of course, many first impression of our cities. And, and in architecture, of course, as you mentioned, professionally speaking, matters in a many, many, many ways. Uh, and But let's say for, um, you know, uh, normal people, let's say if I am to talking to my mom and dad, let's say, uh, I think, look, you know, um, uh, I, I think this is the part that I suppose I still believe in, uh, in architecture, what architecture can do. Um, and I suppose without architecture, uh, probably there is no sense of uh, hum humanities or maybe there is no sense of, you know, uh, interaction with nature, uh, but just possibly a representation of economic model. And this is the part that, you know, architecture can turn the, the ordinary, you know, the cityscape uh, into something that is different and special, but become a storytelling. And, and, and then the question is, uh, you know, what are we telling? What are we trying to say? And, and, and what people are listening, what we people are seeing, and what people are listening and learning from, you know, what we design and what we build. And, and this is the part that perhaps uh, really architecture still very much matters to us and to people that, you know, architecture can create the consciousness and bring people possibly together uh, in a visual sense and, 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 and perhaps this is the part that we w really want to have, uh, uh, you know, the good uh, contribution on what we call uh, naturalizing our cities and, and for the sustainable future. And it is really a very much part of possibly contributing to slowing down, if not completely stopping uh, the climate change. And, and, and in architecture, I believe, can have uh, you know, big play on this. And, and we just need to have, you know, we need to educate people. And architecture can, I suppose, to, you know, be designed in a sense that, you know, educate people and, and make awareness uh, within our societies that it is not just a piece of art to look at. This is not just to provide a function for the certain people that use the space, but this can very much belong to our community and, and to really challenge yourself uh, to do a better things for the better future. Uh, and that's why architecture still matters uh, to us. Yeah, yeah. So often people don't really know that architecture is uh, as much about problem solving as it is about all of the other things. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge facing architecture right now? I, I think, you know, architecture did contribute to, I suppose, not just architecture, but, you know, the, the, the way of thinking is very much still alive. But in a built sense, built world, um, uh, you know, the, the, the lot of toxic, materialities that you know i mean this is very hard because we are also part of it and um, you know we use concrete we use metal glass industrial materiality that pollute the world possibly uh, that's not of course a best intention but really that the biggest challenge how can we you know how can we detox architecture how can we detox our thoughts, thought process, you know, and not just us, it's both consultants, the builders, the clients, very much important part of it. You know, this is really a challenging part. I think it's still not there at all. I mean, we, we have best intention to start with, but along the way, of course, as usual, you need to 
find the balance between economy, between the well-being, you know, and uh, the parts that, of course, you know, contribute to the sustainable future for the planet, you know, trying to do the good thing, but of course it costs, then you lose the profit. So again, the balancing act, this is really very much the biggest challenge that we face uh, in architecture to, to make it the greener and the greenest, uh, you know, the building of the greener and greenest city, uh, you know, surrounding us. And, and this is very much important, but urgent matters that we need to face uh, as a challenge. How do we detox the architecture? Isn't that the challenge of the decade? And um, finally, how do you think architecture in the next decade will be defined? Um, I believe that, um, you know, design can change the world. Uh, well, at least we, we have to try and uh, believe that what we do uh, does, you know, do better things. Uh, and again, your, you know, first discussion about learning from the past and, you know, um, it's, it's, it's a very much uh, important question that who we designing it for. And if it's not just for the present, if it's for the future, for let's say the next generation, uh, including um, you know, uh, children and likes, um, it's really an important subject that, and also we need to believe that design can change the world. And of course, the Winston Churchill, you know, said we shape our buildings thereafter they shape us. So what are we shaping, you know? And then I suppose now really the next decade is not just about the building or say turning building into architecture, uh, but it is about looking after the environment. How do we place architecture in our environment, you know, within this very fragile planet? And, and we have a massive, massive, massive challenge in a, in a global warming. And this is slightly different from what we're experiencing in pandemic crisis sense because it's the immediate threat to us in terms of health with the COVID-19 situation. But the global warming, the rate in which it's coming to us, it's in some way you don't experience it in every day. It's, it's very, very much slow, but it's definitely happening. And we need to really uh, look at this um, uh, architecture that very much uh, a part of the natural environment and it's not just you know making nature available to us but coexist with the nature and and this this would be a biggest question and then perhaps the word architecture eventually may change and I think the, the practice that you know we, we did you know classical to you know, I suppose that industrial revolution that brought us to modernism and then a lot of postmodernism and, you know, contemporary and, you know, you have all this course of history that created this wonderful history and layers of architecture around the world. But we are at the point that we almost look at completely different way of uh, designing and creating something that beyond what we've done thousands and thousands of years, but you know, in a much much more uh, you know uh, natural sense that is become not just use of concrete, which is essentially I call it the you know the dead materials, and but turning that into more living materiality. And I think that the next decade will be defined by more living architecture. And I think this is something that we all perhaps, uh, you know, uh, need to um, um, work on and, and appreciate that, you know, we are the living things, you know, and we try, we, we are not trying to defy death, you know, and, and perhaps in some way, in a strange sense, as I call it, 
maybe the depth of architecture, you know, borrowing the, you know, who has once said the depth of architecture in the sense to, you know, killing the experience, experiential sense of architecture. But what I'm referring to depth of architecture in a sense that this solid and the dead materiality that trying to shape us, but imagine the living materiality, imagine the living aspect of architecture that could, could possibly shape us, you know, and shape our community, shape, shape our world, you know, and I think this is something that I'm looking forward to. Wow, living architecture, what have we got to look forward to? Koichi Takara, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.